minutes of the previous meeting. Okay. I'll let it move to accept. I'll second. Yeah. Okay. That's a major second that the minutes of the previous meeting be accepted. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Okay. Uh, bills and accounts? They're good. Good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You paid them all out. Huh? <laughs> I paid them all out of pocket change. All right, all right. <laughs> Do you need a second for that? Yes. I'll second. Second by Dennis. Uh, motion made and seconded. Everybody in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Carry it. All right. We're going to move down a little ways here and start with the uh, performance contracting uh, meters. Okay. Just to preface this a little yeah. bit. Um, we were approached by folks from Johnson Controls about, you know, a performance contract for energy. Um, they had worked with Kingston School District and Tommy Clapper over there, and Tommy said, hey, maybe you want to talk to the Water Department, and so that's how that all came about. Um, as probably Dennis and you and Bob know, we did this several years ago, and it, we didn't really do anything with it. Um, we were approached by David and, and Greg from Johnson Controls, and I invited them here tonight to kind of give you a very quick rundown of what performance contracting is and how it would maybe apply to us. And then the only thing I'll ask you to consider tonight is just to give me the go-ahead to put out an RFP. Still, still no um, commitment on our part just to get some other, to see the, what the competition is and to get some pricing and so we have something to actually look at down the road. So. So I'm going to introduce David, David Booth from uh, Johnson Controls and Greg Miller. And Good evening. Good evening. Hello, all. Uh, here's some cards that you're welcome to pass around. And Here. thank you very much for having us. Thank you. And Judy, thank you for uh, oh, the introduction. You. So I'll send you this one out. Okay. Greg and I are with Johnson Controls. We, uh, we work with a lot of municipalities to uh, basically identify opportunities for infrastructure improvements and improvements in efficiencies and then monetize those improvements to provide financial benefit to those municipalities as well um, and as Judy mentioned Tom Clapper from the city school district was uh, pleased with the work that we had done there and thought that uh, there might be some opportunities here so um, Ultimately, we're here to help you accomplish your mission. Provide high quality drinking water, make sure that there's an adequate supply for fire suppression, and of course, uh, maintaining your needs and supply for uh, today and tomorrow. We also understand that any projects that you undertake need to be effective, increase efficiencies, um, service delivery or water quality. So, like many water departments, though, there are challenges. Um, in speaking with Judy and Al, and thank you both for uh, what you have shared with us, too. Uh, we understand that you do have some aging infrastructure, uh, meters that are 50 years plus in some cases, um, operating costs that are going up as they are for all municipalities. Um, in looking at your capital improvement plan, there's $22 million worth of work to be implemented. Um, up rate increases over the next 20 years projected at 42%, possibly more. And how can you operate more efficiently? How do you tackle some of these issues? So. Very often, uh, performance contracting is the path that municipalities will take to uh, achieve some of these goals. So basically, what performance contracting is, it's a procurement method. So it's a way to implement infrastructure improvements that are self-funded over time from the benefits that these improvements provide. The uh, Benefits are also guaranteed. 
So it's been around in New York State for more than 35 years now. Uh, it's enabled by Energy Law Article 9. Um, one of the differences between performance contracting and a traditional capital approach is that um, Section 103, which is Wick's law, um, lowest responsible bidder, is waived for performance contracts. Instead, they invite you to look at what's the best value over the life cycle of the project. So it gives you a bit more uh, flexibility and you're looking down the road as opposed to initial first costs. Um, it does specify and guarantee the end results of the project. So that being the uh, financial benefits and the performance of the project. Those guaranteed project benefits pay for the project over time. So it's a way to get work done by leveraging those benefits and not necessarily increase the rates that you might be charging uh, to rate payers. It also preserves your capital for other needs. Uh, we provide a firm fixed price with the project once it's developed and there are no change orders to that. You might want to add too, David, that performance contracting also is a competitive bid, as, as Judy just said a moment ago, is that she'll be looking to get approval for you to put together an, an RFP. So we would be competing for this to be based on our qualifications, capabilities, pricing. So that's one of the benefits that once that is selection is, is taken care of, you don't have to worry about Section 103 any longer. Right. Thanks, sir. And there are some other ways to actually uh, finance the projects as well. Um, bonding, you're very familiar with. Uh, many municipalities will use a tax-exempt municipal lease. Um, certainly, if you have capital on hand, um, that can be uh, included as well. Some other things that um, municipalities like about a performance contract is that it's a single procurement, so that RFP covers you from beginning to end. So it's a turnkey process, um, single source of responsibility. So whoever the water department might select to develop and implement the project is responsible for all aspects of it. So it eliminates some of the finger pointing that could go on with multiple subcontractors. It's basically a design-build approach uh, with a guarantee. Um, and that also reduces the risk to the water department because there's a guarantee in place and there isn't that finger pointing going on. So there's basically four steps to the process. The first being a preliminary assessment. And we worked with uh, Judy and her staff on this part. So Judy, again, thank you. Um, and that's basically to determine is there an opportunity to do a project and does performance contracting make sense? And if there is, then we go on through the rest of the process if you'd like. If not, then we say, hey, it was nice knowing you and uh, hopefully we can help you in some other ways. Uh, the next step is a detailed audit. And this is what, where the RFP comes into play. You would be um, issuing an RFP to select your partner to help develop the project in this detailed audit phase and then implement it and guarantee it afterwards. During the detailed audit, we're looking at your data extract from your billing system. Uh, we would do a large meter survey to actually uh, look at the condition of those large meters. Uh, we'll do meter testing, large meters in place. We'll pull representative samples of residential meters. We can do right sizing and typing to ensure that the right meter is in the right application. Uh, we'll conduct a number of workshops to help uh, confirm scope, select technology, bring in meter vendors. We are vendor neutral. Um, as well as develop the measurement and verification plan that comes into play during the guarantee phase. Um, we will issue procurement for 
the meters as well, so you are getting um, some pretty competitive pricing. We've installed over a million water meters throughout the country now. So we have some pretty strong relationships with all of the manufacturers, um, and we do get some pretty attractive pricing, which helps to lower the cost of a project. David, just to interrupt, just sure. really quickly, um, one of the things, we have 8,000 meters out there. We have probably 3% of our meters are our largest size meters, and they account for about 30% of our water that passes through them and our revenues. Yeah. And so it's important that they be accurate because they're our cash register. So over time, they're mechanical devices, and they get slower as they age. And if they're under-registering, we're not getting paid properly. And that's really the purpose of this, to make sure that our meters... The other thing is it's an old community. A lot of meters for manufacturing, there were three and four inch meters out there. And now you might have converted into offices or condos, and there's sinks and toilets, and we're missing maybe some of those low flows because those older, larger meters never captured those. Right. The accuracy of those meters are really right. for higher flows, right. and now that we have low flows in those locations. Right. When Judy and I, we started evaluating, collaborating on the audit component of the water audit, we found that there's at least 5%, maybe even as high as maybe 10% inaccuracy on some of your residential meters, or more it could be. And we'll know that and we'll, must go into our detailed audit. But that, as Judy said, that's your cash register. Not only is it the cash register for the water department, also will benefit the, the city, sewer, the, the, sewer sewer, the sewer side as well, because yeah. your revenue is based on collecting the water meter is also used for your billing for your for your sewer side. So it's a it's a dual benefit for the for the city. And we'd like to have a discussion if this moves forward with them to see if maybe we can jointly undertake this project because the payback would be that much faster. Correct. Can I would, can I ask a question now? Sure. 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 Go ahead. Okay. With the meters, so how do you know, do you know through billing what size meters you have? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yes. And then you're going to basically look at uh, that size meter versus who it's servicing to determine if the meter is is the correct meter? If it's in the right application. We okay. would sit down with Judy and her team, we'd go look at these number of meters that are in the city and to see where those are currently in place. We okay. find many times, especially when we do the billing extract, we find that there's some anomalies in the total flow that doesn't make sense for that particular meter. That kind of raises the red flag for us to be able to do that. Okay. And then we kind of true up the the total revenue stream based on the water consumption and versus build to figure out where we have some problems. Okay, so okay. It, it probably would more affect businesses and or structures that have been turned into businesses and things like it that. It can, but also you have a number of residentials and if they're, they're inaccurate, they're older meters, Okay. You're you're losing you're losing a lot of revenue there. Okay. Right. Thank Just you. by the sheer numbers of them. Thanks. Chances are the residences will have the right size and type meter. Mm -hmm. So the sizing and typing part would and be more so applicable than the age. Is the age accuracy. Correct. Okay. Correct. Me meters will slow down based on age and flow through them. So you know, and it's kind of an amorphous. Nobody can really tell you where that sweet spot is when you. Should it's kind of secret. Nobody wants to tell you. No meter company wants to say, hey, when a million gallons have gone through there and they're X amount, then you should replace it. Right. Right. It's, exactly. it's kind of an odd thing right. to be able to do. And even AWWA, the mm -hmm. National Water uh, has kind of come up with some kind of wishy-washy, yeah. not quite defined yeah. statements. Is it flow or is it time? That's the and water quality. Mm -hmm. We're blessed with wonderful water quality. Absolutely. So that's going to help our meters. Mm -hmm. Right. But, right. you know, it's an unknown for us. Thank you. Sure. Good questions. Good question. Okay, so then once the project is, sorry, no, okay, uh, once the project's developed during the detailed audit phase, we would come back and share exactly what it looks like, and we'll have been communicating throughout this and collaborating on it. So it is a very collaborative process. It's not us saying this is what you need. Um, we'll use our expertise and make recommendations and then build the project together. Um, implementation would be the next step, and that would involve turnkey installation with new meters, automated, automatic meter reading system, a leak detection system, potentially, uh, integration of the AMR system, into your billing system, um, the notification and scheduling of customer appointments, um, training on all the systems, 
So again, a turnkey installation. You know, yeah, yes, Greg just mentioned, on last Friday I met with um, the day of, we went up to Scotia where they've done this. And they only have 3,800 meters, we have about a little under 8,000. And that one of the appealing aspects of this, of the DPW director up there, was the turnkey aspect. He has 11 guys in his crew, and that's the whole DPW crew. And they had a very bizarre way they were reading meters, like once every three years they'd actually get a real reading and they'd be billing minimums and playing catch up. And, and so he needed to change that. So they were going to install meters anyway. But he liked the aspect that he had one person, the, the foreman on the job that he dealt with, and, that, and they did it all in four months, 3,800 meters in four months, which is amazing. Our whole crew went out there and we did that. All that work was done. And we integrated that uh, very successfully. Andrew couldn't say enough good things about it. And so the benefit there in that quick time frame is you get a lot of work done in a short period of time, but it also means you get to reap the financial benefits sooner as opposed to later. Is, yes. the, is the labor savings part of your analysis of savings? We did and not include any labor savings. No, we didn't. Um, and that was at my direction <coughs> because we have one meter reader now and a meter foreman. <laughs> However, if we were to implement this, we wouldn't lose a person, a staff person, but our meter foreman has indicated that he will be retiring at the end of this year. So we would have an opportunity, and we certainly would recommend that we maybe promote our, our, our present meter reader, and um, we would be able to maybe hire someone else to do maybe maintenance and distribution work, some, where we have a need. So I don't think we have an overall cost savings of labor, but we certainly would, would have a, a redistribution of that. And some communities ask us to put in that operational savings, but in this case, Judy directed us not to, so, and, and we did it. And we can do that down the road if you'd like. Right. And the reason that we would be able to do with one what we now do with two is because with radio and drive-by systems, we could probably read the, the city of Kingston and takes out what to read. We're in seven different zones. If, we build quarterly, there's probably six or eight weeks a year that that meter reader is all caught up. He's, he's very fast, um, and he doesn't have anything to do, and he can do other jobs for us. He works in our distribution group. Mm -hmm. um, one person would be able to read the entire city, uh, gosh, probably in a couple hours. And you could then increase the frequency if you wanted to do that, rather right. than quarterly if you wanted to. You could do it as often as you want for data collection. Right. Yeah. Right. And then the final phase is the guarantee phase, and that is where we ensure that you're realizing the benefits that we've promised. Now, we don't control your water rates, but we do know that we're putting in accurate meters, so we guarantee the accuracy of those meters. So there'll be a follow-up testing. Right. All right, so the preliminary assessment, the first step, has been completed. Uh, that consisted of an AWWA water audit. And we looked at system-wide replacement of the meters, uh, the AMR system, leak detection, and can this be done through a performance contract? Is there value in taking this approach? Um, and we strongly believe that you have a very good application for this. Uh, again, we've been very conservative here. Um, we're estimating the project to be three and a half to four million dollars. Um, probably completed in a six to eight month time frame. Um, it can be fully funded from the benefits realized by the water department. That being said, there will be benefits that the uh, sewer department will realize as well um, as their revenue is based on uh, the water billings. Also, excess annual cash flow after the project is paid for over a 20 year period will be three and a half million dollars or more if we add in the uh, sewer revenues. Right, if we, if we yeah, if we right. work on it together. Right. And those extra cash flows can be set aside for other, other projects within the water department or it could be set aside for in the future for another meter change out 20 years from now. So it all depends on what you 
as the board wants to do with that money, how you want to allocate those funds, it's up to you and the board to do that. Or possibly for dam work. Right. Uh, <coughs> we have lots of places to put that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Every right. municipality, water and sewer in the state. Right. Yes, right. so, absolutely. And, and the, the financial benefits, we didn't do too much of a breakout here, but you're looking at basically a recovering lost revenue from inaccurate meters. So that's a big chunk of it. Um, there can be operational and maintenance savings, and that would have to do with more efficient meter reading. But again, those are not a part of it right now. Um, an AMR system gives you a lot of insight into your billing that you can kind of pull up at your fingertips and gives you the opportunity to provide a greater level of customer service. So if somebody uh, comes up and into the desk here and says that they uh, think that their bill is incorrect, you have a lot of data to look at and you can say, well, here's where your usage started increasing. Here's where it decreased. Did you uh, call a plumber during that period? Did you tell a swimmer? Like, well, a lot of communities like have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, they, they take that amount of money and they sometimes they give that person a break a little bit. But if you have the data, you want to be able to say, this is where the leaks are. This is on your side. This is the water revenue that was collected, and this is what you what you're what you're owed. So, but a lot of communities have done that in the past, which is they're giving away too much money, and it's, it's got to be important to be able to maintain that the city is getting the full revenue. We don't forgive anything. We went through the media to take away. That's good. Right. Believe me, there are some that do that the conversation. If you're estimating bills, we'll give you an opportunity to eliminate that. Um, you will also have the opportunity to bill more frequently, should you choose. Mm -hmm. um, we bill quarterly. Some of our larger customers might prefer a monthly bill. So you could do that. Another part of the uh, financial benefit would be detecting leaks in the system and giving you the opportunity to know right where they are and then address them so that you can stop water loss through those leaks. Um, this is probably a discussion for down the road during the detailed audit, but there may be opportunities to actually improve energy efficiency at some of the uh, facilities as well. It could be windows, boilers, uh, building controls, insulation, etc. You have the benefit here that have, you have a lot of hydraulic working for you, working a lot of gravity in your system. A lot of communities don't have that, where they have to pump a lot before they even get into the treatment. And your cost per million gallons is very, very low compared to many, many other communities in the surrounding area and across the state. So you really reap that benefit, and you have for many, many years here by your design of your system. So it's uh, it's certainly been a benefit. One of the lowest numbers I've seen per million gallons in a long time. Looking at those numbers. The leak detection is that just on the distribution system, or is that on service laterals? Service it would be after the meter, right? In, in the home after the meter. Yeah. It would help in customer service because these most of these meters will take a reading every day. You'd have to go and interrogate them. Some of the, the one system in particular in Scotia, you download 40 days every time you read the meter. And so you can go and you can say, hey, I, I couldn't, we hear this a lot, I couldn't possibly use that water. No, I don't have to jiggle my hand. Oh, no, my, my toilets aren't leaking. And then you say, oh, but look, on July 30th it went up. And then, you know, so it just gives you a better able, ability to talk to your customers. And, and you can figure out how to be more proactive because you can actually call them up and alert. We try to do that now. There's about a three-week lag between when we read and when we send out the bill. And the staff here does a pretty good job at the audit. And if we see that your consumption's up, we'll send you a little postcard and say, hey, we read your meter. You're going to get your bill. We'd like to come and help you find that leak so you don't waste your money and you know our resources. Right. We do that now. The leak detection could be also put out in the distribution system if, yeah. as well, where you can then know where you've got leaks in the, in the pipe. Because many times, leaks don't come to the surface. You know, right. right. I mean, that's a lot so, of times they don't. You know, <laughs> most of the time they don't, unless you see a geyser, which is kind of that's the one you see in the paper all the time. But most of them stay below ground, you know, through gravity. 
and um, those are major leaks on, but you're still having an issue with chemicals and treatment at the plant, you're wasting good valuable water. Right. You have to install some data loggers or some yeah. meters in, right. within, and that's certainly something we could discuss yeah. and something that would, would be beneficial. Okay. And then, of course, the performance guarantee that we spoke of, and should there be interest, we can develop an ongoing meter testing program. And that's especially beneficial on those larger meters that make up 30% of your uh, revenue. So this is just a timeline that we sketched out um, starting with uh, today. If this concept makes sense to you, then we would encourage you to issue an RFP and solicit proposals from companies like us. Um, take a look at those proposals. There's no risk in issuing the RFP and getting the proposals back. Um, I guess it's just an investment in time as you'll want to uh, look through them and evaluate them. Uh, once you have them back, um, you know, we're suggesting uh, February 3rd, uh, then you will have the opportunity, if you wish, to invite the proposers in for interviews. Uh, typically, that's at your discretion. Uh, make a selection. We anticipate a detailed audit would take roughly three months. Come back and share the project. Put together financing. Um, we can assist with that. We typically don't finance projects ourselves, but you probably have lenders that you work with. And we have others. Some of the meter manufacturers will as well. Sure. Depends on what the selection process is. Um, we'll order the equipment and then start construction in August and ideally get it all done. If it is anything like this winter before uh, our first freeze. <laughs> um, I have a question. It might have been on the other PowerPoint. I missed, missed it. Um, you say that this is going to pay for itself, right? That's eventually. Do you have a time frame? Was it like, do we have any projection on how many years it usually takes to pay for itself because of the cost savings? That's something that we would firm up during the detailed audit. Um, I feel pretty comfortable in saying that you're looking at a simple payback that would be 10 years or less based on what we've seen. And once we add in sewer revenue, that payback would be even better. And I have one more question on that then. And it'll pay for itself through revenues that we've lost and, the, and operations and maintenance fees and leakages and things like that. Okay, so that's... That's correct. Okay. I guess a uh, question that I had, and you know, it, it'll I guess more of a board discussion at some point. But you know, the way the you know a lot of these performance contracts work is that you know when you're looking at evaluating um, proposals um, for projects, um, sometimes and maybe with this project it's a little bit more unique. But um, you sometimes look at the proposals to see really um, based how much that company is charging you in the end to do this work um, as part of the performance contract. And it mm -hmm. seems as though if, if we're not finding out what the cost would be or the payback time period until the detailed audit is done, I think that by then we would have had to have chosen a firm already, um, it seems, based on this timeline. So I got a little bit um, confused on, on how we would, other than just selecting based on reputation, we wouldn't necessarily be selecting based on who's going to give us the biggest bang for our buck and who's going to have more overhead or more administrative right. expenses on your end. And so I just, it's a question. Good points. So with a water meter project, and certainly there's a few ways to tackle that. Um, if Judy wanted to make data available to anybody who had interest in proposing, they could come up with their estimates. And you can certainly specify in the RFP what information you'd be looking for right. in terms of numbers. Um, I have seen some RFPs ask for markups on raw costs. And that's kind of 
kind of a quicker way, I think, to uh, do it and still get the information that you're looking for. Yeah. I've seen others ask for um, what the cost of the detailed audit would be, what the buyout cost would be, should the project not be implemented. And I'll come back to that in a second, because uh, that deserves a little bit more conversation. Um, and others have based their selection primarily on qualifications and experience of the company with the theory that the more projects they've done, the more experienced they are, the better the results should be, and the better their buying power. So those are some things that you might want to uh, consider, certainly. So good points there. In terms of the detailed audit, that's an investment grade audit. There will be a cost for that. It does get rolled into that project price, so it's not anything that you need to lay out up front. Um, but whoever you wind up selecting will have a number for you. Um, that's basically a buyout cost should uh, you decide not to move forward with the project after they've done the engineering work. It's also how we structure the RFP. We could always, if we get to the point where after the detailed audit is done and there's no, we're all wrong and there's no viable project, then we could, in the RFP state, then we walk, then everybody walks away at that point. I think a lot of communities have done that. Right. That's right. No, so if there's a project and we don't go forward, then we're on the hook for some. Right. And that's also why we do a preliminary assessment to help identify if, in fact, there's a project. We believe there is one here. If we go through the detailed audit and it turns out we were mistaken that we can't deliver a project that meets your criteria, then shame on us. <laughs> and uh, we're on the hook for that. Um, just a little bit about Johnson Controls. I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, okay. We've done a lot of these types of projects. Um, we've installed over a million meters throughout the country. Um, we're the largest uh, performance contractor in North America. Um, just a small sampling of some of the areas around here where we've done some work. And we would certainly welcome the opportunity to uh, partner with you. Any other questions? I think that right please. We wanted to kind of keep it brief so you can kind of share the business for the, for the meeting, but uh, we, uh, we hope we've answered some of your questions this evening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Thank you. If you do have questions, um, we're here for you. So, again, thanks very much. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Dan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Good. Oh. That was the last one. Everyone else got it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the only thing, I'll put together, I have some blank RFPs and I'll work with Al and Bill and we'll, we'll and then we'll send that out um, to make sure that you know, we have all the bells and whistles in there we need and then the RFP is it's just our time to put it out see what we get. Can you share that with us before you send it out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other players in the field beside Johnson Controls, it, the other major player around here is Wendell Energy out of uh, Wendell um, Engineering out of Buffalo. Okay. And I think Siemens does a lot. Mm -hmm. It also does that work, but not as much in the water sector as the sewer sector that I'm aware of. Wendell did our energy retrofit in the city about 10 plus years ago. That's what, that's what we didn't do. We didn't implement our We didn't go forward with that. Yeah, so we did it on our end. And yeah. Johnson came out better on ours than Wendell did. Yeah. So there's pluses and minuses to that kind of 
contract. So, yeah. Okay. Judy, I'm sorry, but earlier you said something about how we might be able to share the labor. Not the, the, the cost. I mean, whatever we get. So your water bill is, you know, you, you, you use your meter registers 20 units. Well, we bill on our rates and get the water and the sewer. They don't pay as much to take the benefit of that. So if we improve the accuracy of the meters, not only will our revenues go up, but theirs will go up. I'm going to suggest theirs is going to go up more simply because of this difference in the rate structures. If they're a flat rate structure, we have a declining rate structure, and the rates are higher right now for, for most. Um, they equalize, I'm sure. <coughs> but maybe not. But anyway, so that would be something that, you know, if we get to that point and we think it's something, then that's in discussion. With, you know, you and John and, and us to move forward to see if there's an advantage. So that was all. I okay. Hold on. Vinny uh, Water. What? Vinny Water. Remember we went out with it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> My backwards writing didn't work for you, did it? I got it. Yes. I got it. Okay. Sorry. Any water engineering session? Okay. I'll try not to turn this off like I did last night. Greg needs no introduction. <laughs> Ready, I don't know if that's a good thing. Or he promised thing. that this would be way quicker than last night. Very good. And we did. Yesterday. Greg, you want them on or off, or what's your uh, pleasure? Okay, that works. So a lot of the information that I'm going to be presenting tonight on Binny Water Reservoir is going to sound very similar to things I presented previously on Cooper Lake Dam because they're both earthen embankments and they're both part of your water supply system and they both have a dike uh, that keeps water up on the other side. There are some significant differences though as well and I'll walk through them. So this is a presentation on the findings of the engineering assessment. Um, we can probably dispense with the introductions. The engineering assessment uh, for Cooper Lake, as we talked about previously, was due in uh, 2012 August. That was because Cooper Lake is a high hazard dam. Meaning if the dam were to fail, there is a likelihood of a loss of life. Binny Water Reservoir is currently classified as an intermediate hazard dam, uh, meaning that loss of life is not likely. So the engineering assessment uh, requires that you look at the hazard classification and confirm it. You assess the spillway capacity, as we talked about uh, previously. You assess the ability to of the low level outlet to be able to drain the reservoir in case there was an appendix emergency. <coughs> and you look at the uh, stability of the embankment. And that's what we did. I'll share the specifics of that. Um, there are some deficiencies that I'll talk about, the recommendations, and how much they cost, and where to go from here. It should be pretty brief. <laughs> so we looked at the evaluation of the dam based on professional standards and regulatory requirements. So we reviewed all the available documentation that was available both from the water department and from the state records. We performed uh, a dam safety inspection, which is a visual inspection of the dam. We did a hazard classification assessment, uh, which basically is a hydraulic modeling exercise that simulates breaking of the dam and maps where the water would go and then assesses what the impact of that water would have. We did a spillway capacity assessment. Does the, does the dam have appropriate spillway capacity to handle the largest storm on record? The largest storm, theoretically possible, not on record, that was a misstatement. Um, it's a hypothetical event. Uh, in this case, uh, Binny Water doesn't actually have a spillway. Uh, it floats 
on the system. The inflow is controlled. Um, so there's, because of the way it operates, there is a, a minor spillway capacity uh, issue to adjust, but nothing of significance because it doesn't really have a watershed. Low level outlet evaluation uh, was performed, the stability assessment was performed, and then we developed recommendations as I suggested. So Binney Water Reservoir is kind of sandwiched between 209 and the New York State Thruway, kind of perched up. Uh, there's a mention of the hydraulics of the system. Um, water for the treatment plant flows to Binney Water. It's well above the elevation of most of the community. And by gravity, it flows from Binney Water uh, into the community. So it's uh, physically above both 209 and the throughway. We were green before it was cool. <laughs> and zooming in to the facility so you can see more clearly what it is. Um, do you have a mouse to Oh, you can just show up. Do, or, no, I can do this. I can do that, I suppose, if that works. Jerry. Yeah. Well, you can read it. It's, right, right, it's right, quite right, clear. Right, the UV disinfection right, right, facility is. I got it right there. Oh, yeah. Oh. Whichever point. Yeah. Tap on. That's a pretty yeah. good one. Yeah. Right. Where'd you get that? <laughs> I always come Look at that. So, the UV disinfection facility is a new building. Uh, it's built essentially at the toe of the dam. Here's the main dam. Here's the dike. Uh, so water essentially comes into this facility and flows out of this facility. Uh, generally a constant flow comes into the facility and an irregular flow goes out depending on the demand of the city. Water flows out from the gatehouse through the UV facility and then uh, down the hill. There's a old stone outlet channel here <coughs> which is where the original low level outlet was constructed. So there's a pipe in the dam that runs this way and discharges here. It's no longer functional. With the construction of the new UV facility, there was a new low level outlet put in. So you have a functional low level outlet. Water can be bypassed by the UV facility and discharged into the channel. So first in Somewhat significant finding is that the dam should be a high hazard dam. It's currently an intermediate hazard. It should be a high hazard dam. Um, this wasn't identified prior because there was not specific requirements <laughs> stated in how to classify the, a high hazard to an intermediate hazard. There were people's opinions, but in 2012, the state came out with a document that's made specific differentiations between what's intermediate and what's high. And one of those things is flooding of an interstate. Uh, and if you overtop an interstate as a result of a dam break, your dam should be high. The idea is that uh, there is thought that someone driving on the interstate could die. So um, it's clear that if, because of its position in the volume of water, if the main dam were to fail, it would flood an interstate through a um, significantly. Um, I think you'll see it's over two feet, 1.4 1, 1. feet maybe is the number. So that's one finding. So what that means to you, um, I think it means mostly semantics. Um, it requires you to do the things you were going to have to do already at a faster timetable. Um, there's no more regulatory requirement in terms of documents to be produced or assessments to be done, just changes your timetable. The only thing it does change is your uh, requirement for the spillway capacity. It increases that requirement. It means you have to look at a larger storm event. Um, in this case, that has a pretty insignificant impact here. So uh, it's it was a requirement. We think it's a high hazard. It may feel like it's an impact, but it's not really that big of an impact. The, the West Dyke, there is a lot of water at the toe. 
there's a lot of vegetative growth. It's very steep, um, very hard to maintain, and that vegetative growth is it needs to be removed and it's tough to do. Uh, because um, it's now a class C, as I mentioned, uh, we have a bigger design storm. Uh, but what would happen during that event is the West Dyke, which is slightly lower than the main dam, that would overtop it. The West Dyke is only about a four to six foot structure. It's pretty small. And you can see, if I back up, <coughs> that under normal conditions, the area that precedes the West Dyke isn't even underwater. Um, so essentially, under a large storm event, if the water surface were started at a high enough elevation, this could fill in the overtop here. So not a significant impact. It is possible that this portion of the dam or the dike could fail if it were overtopped. And the volume between what you're seeing on the page and um, the top of the dike could be released toward 209. It's an unlikely event. It's a highly unlikely event. Uh, the low level outlet satisfies the DEC requirements. And similar to uh, Cooper Lake, the embankment is stable, but it doesn't meet factors of safety. Uh, nor does it meet some of the basic standards that DEC requires, mainly the, the slope. This, uh, this, the dam is essentially too steep to walk on. Um, and as a result, the staircase is <laughs> the staircase is built there, so you can actually walk up the embankment. Oh, yeah. You, fell off you the can't air. really you can't really uh, walk on it, so it's very difficult to maintain. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of seepage uh, at the toe of the embankment, which um, is sourced. You know, it's seeping through the dam. It's the body of water behind it. There aren't any good controls on that seepage. It promotes more vegetation, and uh, it's something that had been identified previously as needing to be fixed. It just hasn't been done. So, with respect to the hazard classification, I kind of jumped ahead on this, but a mapping of the flood shows that uh, 87 is overtopped by 1.4 foot, and that means it's a class C. And the impacts are the, to the design storm. This is uh, a lot of information, but uh, what what you're seeing here is uh, a computational model of the West Dyke. Uh, yesterday, when we uh, previously when we looked at models of Cooper Lake, it was a similar program, but there is a concrete core wall in the dam. That core wall doesn't exist in the dike. It's just material. So there's really no barrier to seepage through this, through this dam. So what you're seeing here are load cases. The specifics of it don't matter. There are a number that need to be analyzed to meet the stability regulations. And these are the required factors of safety. Uh, anything greater than one is stable. Anything less than one is not stable. So in our review of the information, there was no good documentation as to the characteristics of the embankment. Uh, there hasn't been any geotechnical explorations done here. So uh, rather than uh, proactively doing a drilling program and getting um, um, material specifications on site, what we did is we did a sensitivity analysis to see if there's a reason to go do that geotechnical uh, exploration, and there is. So we made uh, a series of uh, professional judgments on what that material would be, and we can't really come up with reasonable uh, answers to get you to the factors of safety. And that's going to be a, a reference in the recommendation. So factors of safety, in this case, needed to be 1.5, the most we could achieve uh, through our analysis, making conservative assumptions on the various parameters is 1.3, and so, so on and so forth. So what we're recommending is you have to do what you've been required to do all along, which is maintain a safe dam. We're recommending that you remove and control the woody vegetation on the slopes 
We continue to monitor the areas to make sure there's no changes in the seepage. Uh, the, ve the vegetation on the slopes makes it difficult to see if there's any changes in the seepage. And uh, the new valve system that's there for the low level outlet is something that should be operated annually so that you know how to do it, so that you know that you can do it, and so that you know that it actually works. It's only a couple years old. I can tell you that it works. It works. Right? It works. But I, I guess I can tell you that most facilities in, that I've come across have a low-level outlet, and no one remembers opening them. And because no one remembers opening them, they're afraid to open them for fear of not being able to close them. So the only way to prevent that from happening is to operate the valve when you know it's new and continue to operate it so there's a long record that gives people confidence to use it. So at least annually, if not more frequently. And removing, removing, the what is that, removing the vegetation to destabilize the bank? No, we're not talking about pulling roots out, we're talking about cutting it down. So it won't destabilize, destabilize the bank. But the problem with us doing it is it's so steep. It's, so, it's, it's very difficult to do. Possible yeah. for us to do it in house. Um, it's just not safe. And now, though that's kind of short term, uh, because what needs to be done is the, the embankment needs to be stabilized uh, and needs to be flattened so you can maintain it. So the, the recommended activities are uh, on this slide, the more substantial ones. The first thing is conduct the exploration, basically go out there like we did at Cooper Lake and hire a driller and actually take material samples, do laboratory testing on the, on the embankment, install uh, piezometers so we know where their water levels are in the dam. And it will allow us to more accurately assess the state of that uh, embankment. We don't have any expectation that what we're going to find is going to make it meet factors of safety, but it's going to be able to give you a defendable basis for moving forward. Is this the dam and the dike? This is just the main dam. Just the main dam. Yes. Um, you'll see there's one thing that needs to be done to the dike as I go through. So ultimately, we think you're going to need to have a stability buttress built on the downstream side of the dam. Basically, more earth on the downstream side to flatten the slope and weight the, the dam down. A small overflow spillway, which is just basically a riprap for stone lines channel um, for the West Dyke in the event that you do have that extreme weather event. And the low-level outlet that used to be there that was built during the original construction, uh, that needs to be abandoned and filled with grout. Right now, it's just an open pipe in the bottom of your dam, uh, which is um, not good practice. With a closed valve? Uh, with, yeah, the, the valve's, it's actually got an elevated um, the connection's not, the, the, the connection's elevated not connection to be able to open a valve and get the water out has yes. been removed. It was yeah. an interesting proposition the day that the two of us lowered him down on a tripod and a harness down for him to figure all that out. <laughs> was, yeah. we, we saw I couldn't do it because I was afraid. I couldn't even look down because I was afraid. Just uh, so the, more specifically for the geotechnical exploration, this is kind of a, a short term thing. The first thing that needs to be done we need to do an exploration of the embankment and the foundation material. We'll look at the materials, we'll do some lab testing. We'll install, install piezometers, which are, you have a number of them up at Cooper Lake, but you don't have any down here, so that we'll understand where the water levels are in the embankment and how the embankment behaves in terms of uh, the seepage. It's a big word for a pipe that they just yeah. pour down, and we go down with, a, with a, a, an instrument that measures the elevation of the water in there and we record those. Thank you. It's, very <laughs> it's a big word for, I mean, it's for a tube. tube. It's measuring the elevation of the groundwater at a location. That's it. And you drop an instrument down there and it tells you where it is. <coughs> so uh, this is the main dam. This is really where, it, this is where the, the work is. What we're suggesting is that there's a, we put in new drainage on both sides and a, and a chimney drain. A chimney drain basically just is a drainage layer that captures any of the seepage that runs through the dam and drops it to the bottom and then discharges through a pipe system. 
So this is the first thing that you would do. This basically would be installed at the level of the existing embankment. And then on top of that, we would lay new material. This is the berm that I'm referring to. So that would get you a well-drained embankment that's stable. On the West Dyke, uh, basically what we would do is put in a small overflow channel. So this is a cross section of the West Dyke and all we're suggesting is a, a very small, about 10 foot wide channel so that if the water were to get to the point where it could overtop, we would be able to direct it and control it and uh, prevent the dike from failing. And this is the location of the low level outlet I was referring to. That's the pipe that needs to be grounded. Again, this is something that I presented prior in terms of costs. Um, I think I have them identified as classified, but I honestly can't remember what the next slide tells me. Essentially, we're really at the early phases of what needs to be done. It's the first assessment. <coughs> I guess I didn't clarify it. it I know it's clarified, Judy, in the class actual... Four. Class 4, uh, the first bullet. Oh, thank you. Okay. Read the slide, Greg. <laughs> um, so here are the elements of the the bank bank, buttress and drainage. It's about 675. The overflow is just a $15,000 item. The grouting is about fifty for a total construction cost of 740. So class 4. Um, is where we are. We have a 30% contingency in these numbers and we have a city index of 24%. So the, the total project cost, considering what engineering design and permitting and construction management might be, gets you a total cost of $1 million. So because it's a class four, you have an accuracy range so this is where we are, somewhere between 700 and 1.5 million. But un unlike the engineering assessment of Cooper Lake, which left a lot of questions, I don't think there's a lot, uh, there's not a lot unknown here. What's unknown is the materials that uh, the embankment is constructed out of, but that might affect the quantities, the slope of the material that's brought in, not a significant change in cost, I think. Um, the document needs to be submitted to DEC. Mm -hmm. As I said to the board before, there's no schedule in it. Um, the DEC requires that we give them a schedule. There's not one there. So expect them to come back and ask you when you expect to do these changes. And I can't pretend to tell you when and how to spend your money, so that's why we don't put a schedule in it. Um, the next thing that should be done is to uh, do the exploration for the hiring geotechnical drilling contractor, take some samples, and then confirm the findings on, on the West Dyke. And then once we know that, we'll know clearly what needs to be designed and then constructed. I think that's it. Shorter. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Please tell me we don't have any more dams. Yo, we do. I can't, I can't tell you that. We do. Well, I can tell you that, but I wouldn't be being honest. We have more high hazard dams? We have another big. We have, it was a C, Greg. We, we, we reclassified it as a B. We need to talk, we can talk about that. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's not. Uh, uh, DEC's approach is to purchase it. So it, it may be something we want to we want to encourage them to pursue. Okay. Bidwater and Cooper are the most hmm. significant in terms of your operations. The, the Re rest reservoir of four yeah. is an A. Is an A. And reservoir one's an A. Yeah. So there are no regulations, so we're good there. And two is a a, a B. Yeah. And it's it is a B. We it was a C in the reason of making it a B. Okay. 
Thank you. Moving on. Kicking the can down the road, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Uh, management. Great. Thank you. Great. Yeah, no Thank problem. you. Thanks. Thank you. Nice. Nice. Okay. Nice. This is. Um, we will at least we will submit that six or eight months. We'll, they'll get back to us, and then we'll have to come up with the budget for the jail work this year. We can look. We can check that out. I'll check it. Yeah. yeah I, well, I know we. I'm free to leave. All right. I'm sorry to interrupt. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. See you. Okay, asset, asset management. management. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes Jim and I met with Debbie Sheely, who many of you met last night, and um, has been working with us for a long time. Yep. And I think we, Jim, we came up with a schedule on how to manage, um, how to how to do a detailed asset inventory. Um, I, we were able to find the EPA guidance and the free software and some of the stuff that they provided. And we've already we figured by March we should have a de detailed asset inventory of all of our facilities, excluding some of the details on the distribution system. We have the pipe inventories completed. We just need to review it and update it. Um, it's an iterative process. You know, you start at a high level. And you know, maybe at the filter plant you count your valves, and then the next step down is you break those valves down into their component parts, and uh, eventually you end up with a preventative maintenance or a predictive maintenance schedule on some of those things. Um, the goal for us would be to come up with SOPs um, for knowledge transfer in some cases, you know, um, or uh, maintenance maintenance manuals that you know we have a lot of but maybe we need to review those we've had a lot of changes in facilities and personnel so we think Jim correct me if I'm wrong that we'll have this done by June but the, the, the inventory part inventory, of it yeah. and then we'd have to do a condition assessment and one of the things that EPA has put together in this guidance document is the framework for doing that so there's some consistency so you know a rating of one means something and a rating of two means something so there's some and eventually that'll get rolled into being able to prioritize our capital improvements. Um, kind of ha hand in glove with this, we've done a vulnerability assessment, which I think we discussed um, previously, um, and it's time to revisit that. And I think we'll be putting a team together late spring, early summer, in-house to be able to start that process. And it's another pairwise comparison process, although we would never do it all in one night. Where we did it before was there were a couple of meetings that last no more than an hour. Um, break break it out, and then once you have the framework established, you can do the rest by email because I can email you the schedule, you know, the, the little matrix, and fill it out, you know, based on, and then mail it back and it's collated. So it, it's a much um, it's a much <clears throat> friendlier process than we went through previously. So that's where we are. And that's all the news I have on that aspirate event. Okay, any questions? Anybody? All right, make call intake improvement. I have nothing to add to what we, nothing has nothing happened because of the weather, so yeah. it's the same as it was last month. We've improved the safe yield by opening those holes in, in the, um, the wall of the intake. We, uh, working with Greg, we're acting as a general contractor, working with Greg, we've got the grates, the gates, the catwalk, all the ordered, have been approved, they're just Excuse in manufacturing me. and we'll probably install them as soon as the ice lets out in March. So it, it's close. And we're under budget. That's the other good thing. I know. Say that too loud. No. It was a class already, for us. Uh, phase 1B to filter renovation uh, project. Good news there, we get, the contracts are signed um, and they've started work um, in so far as this week they'll be moving a trailer in at some point, their, their construction trailer. Um, they're doing contract sub uh, um, submittals, shop drawing submittals to Tom Lawson, our, our uh, engineer. And, um, you know, we're, we're moving along. I, I expect there'll be a couple, a month or so, we'll all be ready to go. I'm going to drop the contracts Joe signed yesterday. They're fully executed, and we'll be dropping them off tomorrow. So that's that. Okay. Cool.
Cooper Lake improvement. I have nothing to add to what we discussed yesterday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I, what my intention is, all the, all the information and documentation that everybody asked, <laughs> my intention was to put it all on thumb drives yeah. and, and because the spreadsheet, it's much easier to deal with that way than, than you know, a pack of papers. Um, but we're out of them. So I have to wait right. until the, the uh, Jane had to reorder them. But I, I will get them to everybody. And moving on to the treatment plant wash towers. I think you were asking Our about tower. that. I, um, as we reported last month, um, everything's done but the actual bowl, um, and that'll be installed in March. So we're, we're we were. I know it's very cold today, but we were very blessed with that mild spell through December that they actually laid pipes and you know when they expect it to be shut down. So we did we did very well. Did very well. So right. that should be done. We had initially staged one V to be done, and then the tank, the, the wash tower, and it's actually going to end up in reverse. Cool. Okay. All right. uh, rules and regulation update. Hey, Bill. Yes, sir. Bill, here. Did you get a chance to give it back? To bring it back? Yeah. I, the one that we had brought, the one that you discussed, I thought was why you're talking about on the abandonment. What? No, I asked you to, I sent you the rules and regulations that, that I went through and asked you to kind of comment and edit and, and then get them back to me. And you, oh, I figured no. you were busy. I only sent it to you on the 5th. No, I, I did not edit them. I just said you sent them for, for review and discussion. Well, no. I, my intention was to give them to you before I handed them to the board, but we can do it, comp, you know, the I same. I didn't read them. I'm sure. uh, I had no problem with them. I'd like to sit down and talk to you at some length about them. Though. Okay, we can do that. Good. So, I'll just hand out what I provided in a draft form to Bill. These are, we went through the rules and regulations. We figured we'd do them one time, update them, because we had, we were dealing with them more on a piecemeal basis. I did this in track changes. So if people don't want a paper copy, I'd be happy to email this to you if you want to, you know, look at it or whatever. I know that might be more your preference. But I, I printed them in draft so that you can see the changes and that you can make notes. Whatever, whatever it's basis. easier on the web. It's easier to look at it on your computer. On your computer. Know, on computer. But, I, but I know Bob and, and Joe want this. So if everybody else wants, you know, I don't, I don't mind it. I don't okay. Just to take notes. Yeah. 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 You've already made a contract. I know I did. I know. Just but because. It's just see a trouble. Yeah. Well, right. we'll, we'll actually, we'll <laughs> use them to mark them up because the staff hasn't looked at this either. Uh, so it, so it doesn't have, matter. You can keep mine then. Okay. And you can just email us again. Okay. That's fine. I will do that. Are you going to wait to talk to the lines for that? That's in here. So we just that's right, that absolutely. That so, so that's all I wanted to do was get that to everybody. Um, and right. Bill and I will, you know, he and I obviously he has some things he wants to discuss, and I'll take those and incorporate those, and we can talk about it next month. Great. So, there's nothing right. we didn't. We, do you want comments from us back by a certain time? You know, before you the know meeting, or? yeah, like if you could get them to me a week before the meeting, that would give me enough time to if collate them. Either copy me or. Judy, Judy well, whatever you get to me, I'll, I'll make sure Bill gets. That's not a problem. As a general rule, what I did was where where these rules and regulations had specific numbers, like for thirty-five dollars you can do this. I took the numbers out because, in one instance, it says if you violate these rules and regulations, we can shut your water off at the water main. For thirty-five dollars, we'll go back and we'll. I couldn't restore the payment for 10 times $35 today. So they were written a long time ago. Now, we've never, in my 28 years, I've never shut anybody off like that, and I don't think we've ever, but it's there. You never know what's going to happen. So we tried to eliminate that and set a schedule of fees that the board would adopt, and they could be posted and, and given to people. We tried to, to, to make it so that this wouldn't need frequent updating mm -hmm. for those kinds of things. So that was one of my goals. But certain things are, are limited by there's maximum fines that are in the <coughs> order or $50 something? a day per violation, yeah. And that's 
the function of what? What, what maybe? Where where is that information? I believe that's in the charter. That's the city charter or our portion our of the city charter. charter. Which I've included in here. Okay. That's that's in the end. So the city so what and, would and I'm not modify or Oh nothing. Right. We we can't modify anything there. I'm just giving it right. as information. The only thing that the board can do is adopt the rules and regulations. Then the charter's not hmm? But if we yeah, do a so charter so revision. Right, then we would hopefully include anything that you guys have. That's up to updated, yeah. Right. And the Is there plans to do that? I hope so. Okay. The rules and regulations that we have here get incorporated into the city code. We have a chapter on there. So whatever often that, that, that occurs with the city clerk, they get updated. And I don't know what the frequency is, frankly, on that. But we, if we submit what we've approved, then whenever she does the next update, that will get done. All right. Do you want to do Foxhole now, since I forgot it? Oh. You forgot to put it on the agenda? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we had a little incident on Foxhole at Patna. No. On, uh, yeah. No, on the generator. Oh, the generator, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, let's give, let Jim be I, for, I apologize, it should be on the agenda and it's not. Um, we received bids as part of the storm water mitigation, the storm mitigation loan program. One of the projects we included in there was a new generator at our Foxhole pump station. It is amazingly one of the most, of the two pump stations that, that are active pump stations. Um, it is, in my opinion, by far the most important because the Benedictine Hospital gets their water through there. Not that our residents aren't important, but hospital's pretty high priority and critical customer. And amazingly that every other facility we have has all kinds of backup power <coughs> and that just doesn't. So one of the things that we included in this was was a proposal um, to, to, to install a generator. And we solicited bids. We received them last Friday and the engineering estimate for the work, the contract was $60,900. We got three bids. The low bidder was Erase Electronics, uh, 49840 We had one from CDE Electric. Uh, I, I believe they're from New Jersey, I'm not sure. That was $56,200. And the last bill we got, the last bid we got was from Whale and Electric at $68,300. And both Erase and Whalen are local, and we've worked with both of them. In fact, <coughs> Bill Whalen, who owns Whalen Electric, is a sub <coughs> on our Phase 1B project, and um, I think it's a fair sh thing to say that Jim carries our electrician. I mean, he, we call him, we call him, he comes for all kinds of stuff for us. So we work with them uh, both on projects. So the recommendation of Tom Lost and our engineer who put this together of CDM Smith is to award the bid um, to Erase Electronics because they are the lowest responsible bidder and they've evaluated the response. How much was that one again? $49,840. $49, so you need a motion then? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I'll move like that we will accept the bid from Erase Electronics. Oh, no, second. Good. Motion made and second. That we accept uh, erase electronics. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So far, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's a little bit. Yep. And the last piece of that project is the SCADA system. And I think we're going to be able to, to and I don't want to get, I think because we're, when we met on the, uh, for the SCADA project, which is under design, we met with the folks that are, are doing the work. 
um, the work that Kyle McIntosh has done on the city server and the security implementations, uh, improvements that he's implemented over there, um, and the capacity will be able to, they'll be able to host for us. We'll be able to make additional improvements for a fraction of the cost if we had to reinvent the whole thing. And it looks like we're going to be able to, to go forward in that way. I mean, it's, it's a, a good opportunity to beef that up a little more and make it a little more robust and for us not to have to incur the expense of doing it all on our own. It kind of is a win-win. Um, so that project might come in. in the budget. So where is that project right now? What's the That's, we, we had a, our first meeting with the design engineers, um, CDM Smith, uh, with their folks, and um, they're going to get back to us, um, but it's in very preliminary design work. And Kyle's involved, you know, with all that, those details on, on that end. The, the, the two, um, the two, the, the, the design engineer that's actually doing this work, he, he does this all over the country, he's pretty well regarded, and, um, and this is about all he does, um, and the only, the only kind of engineering design work that he does. And he, he, he said he rarely sees a municipal system that's been done what Kyle has done to, to that system. He was, he, was very, he, he was very impressed with what he saw when he went over there. So. Okay. Anything else on that? Nope. Okay. Move on to the correspondence. Just two letters we've had. One is from, uh, one is just a rejection of a grant application for the Cooper Lake Dam project from Homeland Security Emergency Services. And I mean, this was a, we felt obligated because we were contacted and encouraged to apply, but we knew it was a very, very long shot. Mm -hmm. So that was not surprising that that turned out. Well, you take a shot. Well, you never know. You never know when, yeah. when the horse is coming in. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. If you didn't do the application, then you would never know. Yep. The second one is a request from the New York City DEP to waive late charges on a bill that they, they paid late. Um, uh, this letter, I only got this the other day, so it wasn't, I could not have included it in your board packet. Um, the short version of the story is, they got, we mailed the bills on time. They claimed they didn't get them, you know, for several days later. Um, we don't have any control over the post office and how that works. Um, Non-receipt of the bill is no excuse for non-payment of the bill. Um, let me see what else. We impacted their fiscal year. So that delayed their even further. So the bottom line is they, they want us to waive $1,003.45 in late charges. And this is a very similar situation for those of you who are relatively new here. Um, what happened with the county and, and, you know, the same kind of plea that they made for their water bills that were late. And I don't really have much else to say. No. Bill, do you have anything to say? Thanks. I think you summarized it fully. What? I didn't hear him. I think you summarized it fully. There's really, I mean, it, 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 maybe for the benefit of, you might want to explain why we can't do this. You're not permitted as a board to give away any funds based upon a ruling of the Supreme Court. Whether or not you wish to, you don't have that authority to do that. And by waiving any charges is considered a gift giving away of city services. So you don't have the authority to waive them unless an error has been made by the water department personnel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah, 1936 yeah. German. Um, anyway, um, one of the things that Jane in our office has been dealing with this woman over in, in their office over there is that um, one of the things they would like us to do is let them have access to our bank account so they can deposit their bills in. And Jane suggested to her maybe she, they would like to sign up for our ACH payment service 
where we actually would pull money out of their bank account and it became a little Mexican, a very friendly Mexican standoff in the sense that we're reluctant to do, give other people access to our accounts, yeah. just as they're reluctant to do the same thing. So, you know, we can do that if the board thinks that's a quick way to avoid this. We have this difficulty every year right now, but it never, it, 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 this, is, this is the only time that's been in arrears because of their non-receipt. Mm -hmm. Or they're claimed on receipt. I mean, I certainly believe she can get them. I mean, there's plenty of time from the time it's mailed to the actual due date. Well, a minimum of 20 days. Usually it's more like 30. And I don't hmm? see how she could not have gotten what could have happened. She did get the bill. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, specifics are that uh, she didn't get it for uh, approximately a week seven to ten days after it was mailed but they did eventually get mm -hmm. the bill and they got the bill in time before the due date mm -hmm. was there a holiday or something no this was back in august it's 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 there anybody the dec the dep new york city is a very large bureaucratic mm -hmm. organization and it just it takes a long time to get yes. this stuff processed because mm -hmm. of their because of their procedures yeah. and so it was just unfortunate as you know they would have expected to get a bill right they would have expected that bill was coming mm -hmm. so if that had an impact on the fiscal that could have been anticipated and right. yes because the the bill billing schedules are regular mm -hmm. from year to year and I so can, yeah. it impacted it this year would have impacted last year and the year before right. and so on we can certainly provide that schedule to her you know, it, it, the schedule has been mailed on or before, you know, um, when they're due and that kind of thing. So we could certainly provide her with that schedule. I mean, we have a very positive relationship with the DEP. We work together, you know, on many issues. And um, it's just unfortunate. Yeah. Just the way it goes. I just hope we never have to buy any water for them because they're going to have to <laughs> <laughs> Think of the late charges the city's going to have when we pay 60 to 90 days later. So, mm -hmm. that's true. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we, wouldn't we, we don't have that cumbersome system, so. No. But anyway, no, I, and, and I mean, they, they, we help each other out in emergencies, and so yeah. it's, it's um, yeah. if ever I were inclined to do it, it would be for another water utility, but Bill has schooled me well. <laughs> we just got like Yeah. So you don't need anything from us then? No, I'll, I'll write her a very nice letter and, you know, explain that we can. Okay, superintendent's report, three and five. Everybody got a copy of it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody have a problem with it? Don't no disappoint me. You've got to have a question. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, I think I, actually, I do. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, under water system production and treatment, we're talking about the um, chlorine residual problem. Oh yes, yes. You said the residual went below 0 0.2 parts per million for about 40 minutes. Mm hmm And never dropped below 0 0.8. Right, that was a low. Has to be for more than four hours. No, it isn't. It isn't zero. It should be 0.08, I'm sorry. Okay. I must have left out a zero. So I'm, it's I'm my zero, it's point yes. zero 0.08. Yes, it never went to zero was my point. Okay. That would be a problem. Okay. So I read that too. I was wondering about that. Got to make a note. Okay. Okay. That, yeah, that was so it. We should have moved the period over one. I, I left the zero. This one over one. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Point oh 0.08. Okay. Sorry. That was my only question. Yeah, it didn't make sense. I can understand yeah. that. It's not belong. Mathematically impossible. <laughs> and and if, if we had a chlorine residual of 0.8, it would be customers, especially in the area, like Roosevelt Park area in Maryland, um, 
You'd be, oh, you'd be, right. you, you would be calling up because of the, you, you'd yeah. be like drinking Clorox. Taste and odor issues. People would notice that. The number of the differences. We can have the system? Not always. No, no. Not always. So just, uh, Total gallon spill through that it's backwash for the filter operation. That's, uh, some of it could be. Yeah. But that's that's um, that's total gallon spill through so yeah. we're backwashing a lot. Right. Okay. Yeah. There's some of it. Okay. Yeah, I know. I just but, wanted to see if it was like no, 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 no. the million and a half number. No, but okay. it's too hard. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Is there anything else? Um, okay. One other thing that's not on uh, my report that just to be aware of, especially in particular for the mayor, we have a, a pretty good sized leak on Beale Street. Um, we've been looking for a while for this leak, and Ralph inadvertently found it a couple of days before Christmas because it's going right into the storm line and going right out to the creek. Um, we will, it's certainly something that we can undertake to fix, but the location of the leak is in a pretty precarious spot in that it's under both the two new siphon lines and the storm line. Our main is about nine feet deep, eight feet deep, and they cross right on top of us. So they go obliquely across the road and we, we're coming straight down the road. So, and we, we believe the leak is right under their infrastructure. This is what, the sewer line? The, the two, yes, they're, 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 one is the old siphon line, and, the, and the, the two new siphon lines and the old force main. They're, they're all, yeah. And where on the Street is this? At the Hudson, right just by the Powerboat Club, by, by uh, the old Fisher Shop Club, by Hudson Street. Okay. Is that the one we hit a few years ago when we flooded the park with sewage? Okay, great. Then we redid it and put the new lines in. You got it. And it's underneath okay. that. Yeah, that was, okay. yeah, that was it. Right in that, right near Black Park, just right. up yeah. by, by uh, yeah. Todd yeah. Dunn's place. Mm -hmm. um, in order to fix it, we're going to have to, it, we're so deep, we're, we're, we're no question we're going to have to close the Beale Street for three or four days. Um, so we're going to need to work with the DPW on how to reroute the traffic. We're working with Ralph to kind of, you know, how does he want us to sling and support that infrastructure? We'll be working with the sewer plant and how they need to shut that line down while we're at least under it, and clear their wells and so how they can do it. So it's not something that we can do like, I think I'm going to go down there and dig that and fix that mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, so there's some challenges involved. We're likely going to wait until the weather is a little bit better because as much as I don't want to waste the water, this leak has been a while. And in talking to the property owner who's going through the bulkhead by his property, um, it's been something that he's been noticing and mentioning to the wrong people in the city for a while. So we'll, we will be fixing it. So when you see us down there or, or you know, you can't get through, okay. we'll yeah. know what it's about. Life in an old city. That's the way it goes. That's it. All right. Anything in executive session? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We didn't approve the superintendent's report yet. Oh, oh geez. Yes, yes, that's right. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Al. Well, I'll move. You're welcome. I'll second. I'll second. I'll second. I'll second. I'll second. Now. Good. Right. Approve the superintendent's report. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? No. Okay, fair enough. And the only reason for the executive um, session is to brief you on union negotiations, the status of our union negotiations, and to do um, personnel issues. Um, and not just personnel issues, but employee um, performance issues. Okay, so we're going to go into executive oh, session. Okay. okay. Second. Bob. Second. Sam Clark? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're out of okay. the session. Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. So, I'd like to make a motion to give 
dirt, urchins, an increase of $3,500. Effective when he re becomes a lab director? Yes, upon receiving the certification. I second it. Motion made and second. Is just one question on the motion. Is the slide all being changed? No. no. That is not required. I, I check with both Julie and Jackie. Do you have a second on that, Missy? Second is Joanne. Joanne. Yeah. Joanne. Okay, the motion made and second that we do the raise thing. Get a vote. Uh, what? Excuse me? A vote. A vote? Yeah. The All in favor. All well, in favor, right? Say yes. Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, I guess a second All right. motion is to mo promote Kyle Petromoff to a water service assistant, effective the next pay period. Mm -hmm. I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second. Motion made and second. We need the salary out. Uh, we Gary, if, uh, if, if uh, you want to put that in the motion, I don't know if you need that or or we pay them all this. We pay them whatever the yeah. base salary is for that title, I guess. Yeah, as long as that's yeah. no deal. Okay, any objections? No. Okay, motion carried. Um, also make a motion to provide a one percent. Increase in salary raise for management effective the next pay period. Mm -hmm. I'll second. Go ahead. Second. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Carried. I guess the last yeah. one is the town of Olmster. I'll make that motion go along with the town of Olmster's proposal. Okay, you want to verbalize that? Yes. Uh, help him in? I would suggest that it just be that the president of the board be authorized to respond in agreement to the letter of the town supervisor dated December 18th, mm -hmm. 2015. <clears throat> indicating it's been discussed by the board this is an administrative change with respect to the billing practices uh, the water supply to the town of Holster. that's all you're doing I believe correct so, correct okay any objections <clears throat> so you have a motion and a I have I have a motion I need a second I'll no, I'll second. second okay any objections no no uh, all right. Let's just have the letter put together. I'll sign it. Okay. No, we're going to wait for Zach, right? We'll wait. Yeah, we'll wait, wait until next month. Well, that, to do that, that. It's cleaner that way. You're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Something happens between now and then or something. Yeah, we'll give ourselves a raise. Right. <laughs> I'll explain it to him. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I communicate to him that it's gonna procedurally happen. You're just going to wait until get effective. Okay, we're going to adjourn. Motion to adjourn if there's no other. To adjourn. Second it. Motion made and second. Second it. Okay. Joanne. 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 Joanne.